James, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess for those who don't know me, the main thing I'm known for is I run, uh, I host Hermetics Podcast, which is a podcast focusing on forgotten philosophers, um, unknown thinkers, that kind of thing, forgotten philosophy, overlooked people. Um, I also write, I've got a few books out, one, a conversion story from sort of a nihilist to a Catholic and a few other books, uh, writings around questioning modernity and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Cool. So the topic today was reasons to believe in Catholicism. I'm an atheist, so I don't believe there is any God of any kind. Mm. Could you tell me some of the reasons you believe there are for belief in a higher power? Hmm. So tough. That's that's the big question, right? Like, so you're you're jumping straight in the deep end. Like, I'm hesitating already. Why do you <laughs> believe in God? Right? It's like it's like. Uh... Hmm. Why do I believe in God? You know, I wasn't, I'm like, I already know because I used to be an atheist. You're looking at me like he's already tiptoeing around the question. But I used to be an atheist. I used to be a militant atheist. So for me, for my 17 year old self to know that I'm going to church twice a week sincerely is like insanity to me. But that, but equally, the question as to like, why do you believe in God in a certain sense? comes across as the question of like what could you do to prove would you say that it could be rephrased as what could you do to prove to me that god exists because i think there's a difference mm -hmm. between like on a certain sense like why do i believe in god i could give you a personal answer which is i know for well is not going to convince you so are you asking that for to be convinced or you're just asking like why do i personally believe in god well i think it's more like uh, is there a rational justification for belief in a God independent of whether or not it convinces me or you? That doesn't really make a difference. What matters is, is, is there some kind of rational justified evidence of some kind, regardless of what anyone thinks? Well, you could, you could jump to like the five common arguments, which are given in that book, five proofs for the existence of God, which I think are all sort of the, you know, the uh, Frazier one. Yeah, the Frasier one, which I don't think is amazing, but it's like the common jumping point of like, you know, there they are. Um, well, just I, Frasier and Thomistic arguments are pretty rare, actually. I mean, I think um, it's a very small minority who use them, but I am familiar with those. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of the other book I would lean towards is like, um, what is it called? The Atheist Delusion by uh, Louis... I've, I, mean, I interviewed him. It's really bad, but I. Hmm. Well, I, I feel you. You interview so many people, the names kind of get lost in the space. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's so tough to defend because ultimately, at the end of it, there's a, um, there's a, there's a. It's in, okay, let me like wind back and just go on a completely abstract tangent, which will hopefully help my case. So recently, I did a discussion on uh, a thinker which who isn't really that well known which is what I tackle, obviously, a guy called Irving Babbitt. Now, Irving Babbitt um, really holds this midpoint between capital T tradition and like objective truth, traditional values, and understanding why they're extremely important, important to um, you know hold the values of a society. Like You need these anchors. But equally, he's also um, well-versed enough in, say, orientalism in alternative religions in understanding that the subjective turn of the day so this is eight late 1800s through to mid 1900s um he's understanding that look we're taking a subjectivist turn so these 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 values which we hold as true so-called objective values are going to have um you know the subjective turn is going to come in and people are going to begin to basically do, you know, do their own readings of them. And um, his point was, is that he said he was taking the positivists, so people who can, you know, the only thing you have is your own experience. He's saying, well, the positivists don't actually go as far as they themselves should go. So they're all about human experience, but they basically limit that experience to material empirical existence and don't uh, include spiritual experience. 
So his that would be really almost my own beginning point is like, I know what it's like to be an atheist. And I know almost the, basically the futility of trying to win someone around to it because there is always uh, like, not to sound too pretentious, like a Wittgensteinian experiential element to belief, which is the key element needed to make the leap. Like I could give you, you know what I mean? Like I could, we could sit down, I could say, here is every single rational, rational, reasonable, reasoned argument for the existence of God. And I know from when I was an atheist, I could read through them all. And at the end of the day, I know full well as someone who is now a believer that that isn't always going to be enough to, and isn't going to be enough to bring you across. Oh yeah, for sure. My, my goal isn't to convince anybody. I don't really care about whether or not anyone's convinced. My goal is more to okay. think of it from the perspective of, we know the human mind and experience is very fallible. And so mm -hmm. many of the experiences we have aren't real. They're fictitious leprechauns, mm -hmm. unicorns, fairies, Santa Claus, those mm -hmm. kinds of things, clearly just figments of our imagination. And so the goal of any epistemology is to find a way to differentiate the imaginary things from the experiential things. And we want to be able to say, is this thing that we're experiencing one of the things that's just a product of my mind and my imagination, or does it actually correspond to reality? And so Products I of agree. your mind. Products of your mind are real to a certain degree, though, in terms of thoughts and dreams. They they are real in some empirical sense. Right. They they exist in reality, but they only exist in reality in your mind, not outside of your mind. And so the question is, does this thing correspond to the reality outside of your mind, or is it just a figment of your imagination? Uh, and so mm -hmm. the same thing would apply to religious experiences or spiritual experiences of a divine being, as it would to um, optical illusions, unicorns, fairies, or just any new scientific thing we haven't confirmed yet. And so the reason the positivists like to use experience is because mm. the methods to verify experience are very reliable in differentiating these two things. Whereas there mm. doesn't seem to be a reliable way to differentiate other kinds of experiences like spiritual ones. And when we apply science or like the logical, po I'm not a logical positivist, but mm. they would apply empirical methodologies. It would put those experiences on the imaginary side, not on the real side which mm -hmm. therefore they would then conclude they were imaginary. And so I think that to have that position that you described to be justified where there's this other class of experiences that also needs to be um, included in our epistemology, mm -hmm. you would first need to find some methodological way to mm -hmm. justify that those experiences correspond to reality and not just our imagination like leprechauns or unicorns. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. No, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, immediately there is this entry into the that science has this tautological relationship with itself where like its own hermeneutics and its own uh language is what justifies itself so there is always that problem that like anything which hasn't been contained within the language which it considers um given then it will it will push away um generally like um, like people people the, as soon as the, the term science comes in people seem to think that like emotions don't play a role and uh you know i'll keep drawing in obscure writers who probably won't help my case in terms of proving things but like i'm reading wilhelm reich lately and he calls this the emotional plague where basically once a certain scientific idea takes precedence within a culture the emotional plague is the the emotions which just try to keep that at bay even if evidence comes into the, contr the contrary of it the, the emotions basically hold it. And of course, a lot of people go on about this th these days, right? Between the difference between science and science TM, like there's this sort of pop science where people keep adhering to, you know, whatever it may be, even if there is evidence to the, to the contrary. Sure, sure. There's definitely biases play a part, but what we need is like in science, there's always a way to mm -hmm. overcome that bias. Like People were biased against Einstein because he said that space and time literally bend. They're physical objects and they literally bend. Philosophers thought that was just the dumbest idea ever. They're, they're abstract concepts. They can't bend because abstract objects can't bend. It's, it's a silly thing. It's like saying love can bend. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but he made testable predictions. He was able to predict the future about things we would had yet to discover, an experiment mm -hmm. we would do and what they would what the results would be. And he got it right. And that means that it doesn't matter what his emotions are. It doesn't matter what your emotions are. He was mm. able to predict the future. So emotions no longer play a role in being able well, to, to. What would be needed? What would be, so that your point is about being convinced of a God. 
what would be i guess to try work backwards right like what would what would you need what would you need to be convinced of a god novel testable predictions what, what does, what what does that mean? mean what does that mean uh, it means predicting something about the world we don't know yet and getting it right before we know it uh hmm. okay so what would, what would that look like uh like in practical in practical terms well, it could be anything. You could say, uh, I believe in a God. Uh, every time I pray to a God, he'll give me a gold brick. So you pray it, a gold brick appears in front of you. That That's that's a novel prediction. Or uh, God will block out the sun if I pray to him. That's a novel prediction. Or the things in Revelation, the book of Revelation will happen where like a quarter of Christians are going to magically disappear and their clothes are going to fall to the ground. That's that's a novel prediction. Or dying and going to heaven and seeing God. That's a prediction. So just any prediction about future experience that we don't know yet that can that it can consistently get correct that other models don't yet do. Okay. So be so when you when you die uh, arriving in heaven would be a, a that would be great evidence. Yes. It would be great evidence. So I just out of interest I mean what do you think of uh the hundreds and thousands of the so-called miracles the, the things that are defined as miracles which have happened which by and large science doesn't have explanations for what would you consider them to be? Well the second part the by and large, science doesn't have explanations for it. that part. I'd probably disagree with that because all okay. of the miracle claims that I've read, I know there's a really big book, 500 pages by Craig Keener, where he goes through a bunch of miracle claims. And mm. I've gone through those and a bunch of scientists found the best examples of those, the five or 10 best examples of his to try to mm. investigate. And when they investigated him, they found out that they are completely flawed. So like one of the ones he used mm. was there was a professor of psychology, I think, who had a testimony of a patient who was in a hospital bed and had a near-death experience and they floated above the room and they saw a serial mm. number on the top of a ventilator or something and they got mm. the number right. Um, well, when scientists went to investigate that, it's hearsay from the professor. There's no medical records. They don't give anything from the from the which hospital it was. There's no doctor's records, none of that. Secondly, ventilators aren't seven feet tall. They're, they're four feet tall and there's the VIN number is not on the top. It's on the side because um, mechanics need to get to the VIN number so they can inspect it and write it down. So all of the facts when checked were false about how the mm. things work. And the same thing applied to all the different cases that um, he mentioned. And there's mm. several other big cases like the red shoe in the other building, um, hearing stories while in, while your heart isn't beating and then being able to recollect the stories like all of these have scientific mm. explanations um there's some other possible miracles like spontaneous healings um mm. spontaneous remission is very well understood in science it's definitely because just like you can spontaneously get a disease the disease can also get a disease and die um and so the fact that genes when they replicate deteriorate um any like cancer or polyps in the stomach or whatever are mm. also made of cells and they also divide and damage and could then themselves die just like any creature could die prematurely, um, which could then cause a remission of the disease. And so I don't see of all the studies I've been through any examples of any actual miracles that happen mm. at a greater rate than random chance in natural causes. Okay. It seems like your mind's already made up. Well, on the things that have been presented to me and that I believe I have a better explanation for, sure, I don't think those were evidence. But the question is, is, is there any that better indicates the conclusion of a god than a, a naturalistic conclusion, independent of my opinion? Opinions don't matter. I don't care about opinions. Like, if we say there is evidence, the world is round. Nobody gets an opinion. Even if zero people believed it, it's still, it's still going to be evidence. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I don't, I, I, you know... Uh... My my focus with the I, I've never massively been an apologist. Uh, I'm not. I I said in the email to you, I'm not really an apologist. Like I'm not uh, equipped to, to to deal with that thing. My 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 uh, writing and talking on Catholicism is really after the fact of uh, what we would consider to be grace. And then really it's my more focused on meaning. Like I'm like, yeah, I'm, I said in the email, I'm not an apologist. That's that's okay. So what do you mean by grace and what are the areas you do research into? Well, the, the main thing for me is about um, uh, God in relation to meaning in life. So my, my general um, 
my general statement that I go to is God, or, God or nothing. So, like, basically, if you don't have God, there's pretty much no point in existence. Why would you feel like that's the case? Uh, well, once once you don't have God and you don't have the objective transcendent value system, absolutely everything is relative, and it's just as meaningful to kill yourself as it is to exist. And I, I have yet to find any way to get around that decision. Oh, right. So, so I'd say, why do you need a God to have objective meaning, your value or purpose? It seems like there are many because alternatives. The, because, because it's beyond because it's beyond the, the uh, human epistem uh, human epistemology. It's something that is greater than our own efforts. Because if it's just our own efforts, we can just keep going into it, tweaking it, playing around with it, right? Right, absolutely. I totally agree there. So for something yeah. to be objective, it has to be independent of human opinion. Totally agree. But there's lots of things that are independent of human opinion mm -hmm. that aren't a god. So like sure. if the laws of physics are describing the fundamental nature of reality, there could be a quantum field or something, and that's the fundamental essence of reality. And there could be one that... Mm -hmm. Uh, gives us meaning and purpose and value. And so you could have that without a God. And you still have those what, things. What a, a quantum field would give you meaning? Sure. Why How not? would it give you meaning? How would it give you meaning? Because meaning would be like the essence of the field itself. So its existence would be this essence of meaning stuff that just permeates the universe. Well, so because, I don't know, to take, a, I guess, a, a more basic example, like because gravity is this uh, objective law, which is like whatever gravity is, it is, yeah. Sure. Um, because that's there, that gives you meaning? Well, no, no. So gravity obviously wouldn't give you meaning, but if there was something oh. that was meaning, that was like gravity in that it permeated the universe, and it is meaning in the same way that gravity is gravity, then mm. we would have meaning in that universe in the same way that someone who existed in a God-based universe would have meaning because it's grounded in the nature of God. So you can have meaning and purpose, morality, whatever else, grounded so, in the nature what, what, of reality. What is this thing? That, what is this thing which permeates reality? Well, it could be infinitely many things. That's kind of the point. Is that you don't need a god to have any of those. It could be a platonic object, an a priori abstract, a law of physics. I like law of physics. One's the best. Oh. Um, but I don't, the, they you, they, I don't think they give you meaning, though. Well, they would give you the meaning in the exact same way God would. So if God can give you meaning... The nature of reality could give you meaning. Well, I think I think from from the the general understanding of God as a creator, uh, and from that becomes the you know comes the theology of understanding why such a being would create, as opposed to I mean, what uh, of course the difference here between is between you know creation and what is your own understanding. Big big, I'm pretty behind. I'm you know probably people in your chat will dunk on me for this. I don't know what the the current day science is it still big bang is that still the yes still big bang okay okay well um, the big bang is the beginning of our universe and that was yeah. started by most likely quantum fields or something so there was something okay. before the big bang yeah okay well i'm not going to be the cliche and say what was before quantum fields and you know the first mover thing um i think it's just as easy to do the first mover for god as it is for the science but so what, well, that's actually what, a really good point. Why wouldn't you be able to apply the same reasoning to meaning and morality? So just like you could say, who created God? And you could say, oh, no, God's uncreated. He just has some yeah. essence of being uh, necessary. Um, when you ask the same thing about meaning and purpose, you could mm -hmm. reflect the same argument um, in the exact same way. So just like you could say, no, the universe is uncreated. It has some well, just necessary. The, the, different, the difference there is to do with a will. So God's will is what up, upholds all things. And that that uh, the act of creation, as opposed to what I understand, to just be like a spontaneous material uh, development, that you would have to, would you, would you say there isn't, that there is a key difference between the two actions? I don't think so, because when I've you researched don't think into it, the difference between creation, like a willful creation, which there would have to be a reason for, like if you create a piece of artwork, there has to be, there is some reasoning behind creating that beauty, whether it's out of some emotion, and there's a difference between that and just like some paint buckets falling to the floor. Yeah. So, like, if you think about any action, a decision uh, that was done for a reason, uh -huh. the decision is either going to be determined by that reason. So like I picked mm -hmm. chocolate ice cream because I like chocolate ice cream or something, mm -hmm. or it's going to be determined by no reason. It's just going to be random. Mm -hmm. so like I'm going to randomly yeah. pick that one. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the difference random. between God and creation, right? Well, but take a, take the paint falling example. 
Either yeah. the paint fell for a reason, like gravity caused it to yeah. fall, or rock yeah. rolled down the hill, or it happened from some randomness. So like mm. a quantum field, random fluctuations or something. And so in essence, the whether it was a decision or it was an action of an unguided force, you still only have the exact same two options. Either they were predetermined by some reason, um, whether it's like gravity or I like chocolate, or they were perfectly random and had no predetermining reason. Mm. And so if you want to say we have meaning because God willed us into existence for some purpose, mm. we could just say we have meaning because the nature of reality created us for some purpose. Why would you need the will thing? If you, you, you haven't really worked out what the nature of reality. I mean, there, as I understand it, it's it's mostly just Darwinian selection. Well, that's for, the current for why we exist. Yeah, right, right. That's the current scientific view. But I'm saying if you want to go way beyond the science and say that there's this all powerful being who mm. has a intentionality, non physical mind, um, mm. om omnibenevolence, all those kinds of things, we can do the same thing on the science. End. We can, we now can go beyond the science and say there's this law of physics that entails morality and meaning and purpose. We haven't discovered it yet, but we haven't discovered God's properties either. Um, but we could equally as well explain meaning and purpose and morality on a naturalistic worldview by making up a new law of physics, just like a theist could by making up new properties of a god. Mm. May, well, maybe once again we could work. We could do like a discursive argument and work backwards. So, what what's the meaning in your meaning in your life? Like, what's why do you can why 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 uh, why do you continue to exist? Mm, pursuit of happiness. Mm. so what like so where where does you know where does happiness as a as some reason to go for it come from wow. and and what and what defines happiness at the same time you know like what i'm saying is from the from the, from god's will and from the understanding that that god's will has done some things for a reason in relation to human being I can't go too deep into theology the theology of it would take too long that itself um develops why you know certain morals are the way they are certain things are the way they are etc whereas without that i mean i don't see how material natural processes can develop like what happiness is or what beauty is or what it is to be good those those virtues are are rooted for the believer in the understanding of god's will and and creation well, did God make those arbitrarily? He could he could he just make those anything he wanted to, or like could he say your purpose is to drown babies? That's what your purpose is, or is it limited by his nature in some way that uh, they have to be moral or free in some way? There's like something about God's nature that he imbues our purposes with something specific, and not just he can just arbitrarily pick whatever he wants. I don't know. They are what they are. It is what it is. So why couldn't we just say the same thing about a law of physics and say? There is a new moral law of physics that imbues us with meaning and purpose, and it is what it is. Because there isn't. Well, I mean, I would say the same thing about a god, obviously. But the mm. question is, is if we're going beyond the evidence, if we're going above what we have in science, it seems like we could just posit a new thing like a law of physics, just like you could posit a god. And I don't see mm. why that would be less able to ground morality and meaning than God, because you said you can only do it with a God, and I don't think the, that's true. In, in, in a certain sense, right, once again, I'm not trying to avoid things, but I think, I, you know, whether or not your audience, I can see their comments, would believe me or not, I did used to be an atheist, and, like, one of the things I spent a lot of time writing about is, like, I'm, I'm almost, I guess, what you, a pessimistic, but a bad Catholic, because, right, we're meant to be missionaries and spread the word. I just know, like, this is the leap. And the leap is one of faith on both sides. Like you, well, you have, you have, you have whether and whether or not, like you can have faith in, you can have faith in science and you can have faith in God. And of course, you say, well, no, we don't have faith because we have evidence. But it's like, well, in this context, I would agree. So I'm saying that yeah. we no, can. It's, both... it's like this is always an input. This is always an impotent discussion, and I know it from my time of being an atheist. Like this is like, it's honestly pointless. And I don't well, mean that as... Uh, well, there's one you thing know. you said. So I want to agree with that if I am mm. positing this new law of physics, there's no evidence of that. So I have to believe that on faith. Like, I don't have any evidence of this. And so that would be the same as you having faith in God, don't have any evidence for it. You just take it on this leap. But the one thing you said where I think we don't have to have faith on is where you said it's impossible for there to be meaning without a God. That point, I think we can prove false. We don't think we need any 
you need like well, you can, have, you can have you can have meaning but i th- i think um it can't be objective you could, at, at what what worth is a meaning if at any point you can just rip out the structure and do the like well, no, no, the so, so i agree with that but i'm saying that mm. we can have objective meaning and purpose that is above humans humans have no say in it mm. whatsoever like if it's a law of physics or if it's a platonic object or if it's an a priori abstract there's ways meaning and purpose can be grounded in reality that don't entail a god so you can have um the nature of reality like a field of karma would be one way that just exists as a fundamental part of reality and it gives mm-hmm. all every being meaning and purpose but mm-hmm. it's not a god it doesn't have a mind doesn't have no. any consciousness doesn't have any intentions it's just a part of its nature to give meaning to things with souls or to sounds like it things. sounds like it's it's all means and no ends like at the end of the day if there's no ends and no consequences then like if there's no consequences to your meaning then the meaning doesn't matter well, I would see those as same as different. Well, things. to do like, to do with this to do with this field, you said about the field of karma, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, like the 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 notion of karma, as I understand it, I'm not too well versed there. The notion of karma is is you know like that. My name is Earl. Karma is just completely false. It's to do with what's going to happen in the next life, which means there is a consequence. But if the this karma thing you've come up with is in a world where there, at the end of it there is absolutely no consequences, the meaning doesn't matter at all. There is no values there because nothing you do actually matters because there's no there's no consequences. I don't, I don't think that's true. But even if it was, that wouldn't that wouldn't undermine the argument. So even if meaning is uh, contingent on there being consequences, we can have a karma that has consequences or whatever, mm. and so it would still be valid. But I think that I don't think you need um, consequences for things to have meaning. Like even if say this is our only life and nothing, there's nothing after it. Killing mm. someone, I'd still say, is immoral because you killed them, not because you're punished in the afterlife. So because without, the action without, in and of without, itself has meaning. Without without God, what makes killing someone immoral? I'm not saying I'd kill someone if I didn't have God, because I personally believe that. Were you? Here's a, here's a question. Were you ever taught to not kill? Do you think that's something that you were taught to do? Yes. Like socially? I think so. So if you were never taught it, you would have just gone out and killed and you wouldn't have understood that as something that you shouldn't do. Because I don't think I was ever taught not to kill and I just understood. I would say it now, on, like it was written on my soul as conscience, you just don't kill. Because I think naturally as humans, we understand that someone who goes out and kills without reason, like I think there's some reasons for killing that we can all understand, right? But someone who just does it in cold blood, we naturally understand that's not the thing you do. And I don't think that's like socially taught or darwinly programmed because there's like if you to go like hardcore darwinism there's probably plenty of reasons why murder and a load of people would be beneficial in the darwinian sense right i would agree so i'm a moral mm. realist i believe there is objective morality and it's not just darwinian yeah. evolution it's i think it's like a law of nature it's the moral naturalism is what the position is called where's that come where's that come from Law of physics. I think there is a fundamental essence of reality that is a moral law of physics. Just like you think God's nature is moral, I sounds, think there's sounds, a thing in a reality. Like, sounds a lot like God, but it's not. It's never mind. No consciousness. Mm. So it's just a, a field of physics, just like gravity, that is a moral field and imbues moral value onto things like conscious yeah. agents. And there is a maxima, a maximum state of what that would look like if the law was like supervening on everything so if you imagine gravity was the most powerful force in the universe and it overruled everything else everything would just clump up into a giant ball but it doesn't mm-hmm. it's only like a moderate force it's pretty weak doesn't doesn't change anything the moral law is kind of like the same thing it has this weak pull but if we maximized it increased the power of the law to its highest possible state there is a best way the world could be and it would be what i think it is is a world where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing or hmm. the technical term would be any involuntary imposition of will is immoral. That's the, that's the technical term. Um, non, non, non-aggression principle. Sort of, sort of. Yeah. But yeah, it's close. But yeah, so I think that there is the subjective morality. It's a law of physics like gravity. It doesn't have a mind, but it permeates everything just like um, gravity does. And so we can yeah. have moral value how, in things. How is, that, how, is that, how is that proven within the same methodologies like physics generally? Well, it hasn't been proven yet, but we could make novel hmm. testable predictions, which I've made about what we'd expect to see in other alien life forms and what we'd expect to see in the future Mm. of moral progress and so if my model is correct we would expect as we gain more technology and more resources we become Mm. more morally um good in the fact that we 
want to impose less and less until the point it goes to nothing. But I, I mean, that, that, the morality is also culture dependent. I mean, as for within certain cultures, it was perfectly moral to sacrifice people at right. certain points in time. Right. But my argument here is that as we gain more technology and intellectual resources, um, all societies will be affected by this in the exact same way and be what would a perfectly okay. What would a perfectly moral society look like in this case? Uh, there would be no involuntary imposition of will. There would be, it'd be impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. That would be a perfect world. Okay. What about the double negative that if, if a small tribe uh developed or a small nation developed in this world who did want to bring back some form of sacrifice and another nation disagreed i mean what happens with like uh interventionism in this case well in this world it's physically impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to so it's not like you can just choose to do it or um you can have whatever desires or intentions physically you want. impossible so people yeah. are like condemned to not have free will well, no, you can still have equally as much free will. Free will is so in this world, it's physically impossible to be bad, be immoral. Mm, no, still, no. still possible. Like, right. so you can still do things that specifically Christianity would see as immoral. So, like, you can still think whatever you want. There are no thought crimes right. in this world, right? Right. Um, and you can still kill people as long as they consent. Or, like, if you consent to go to a world where it's allowed to kill people, you can still kill people. Um, and so the only in this world, you have equally as much free will. Um, and right. You don't have free will. I hate to say it, but if you can't kill people, you can't still, you don't have free will. Does Stephen Hawking think... have free will? Yeah, and within the limits. Of... What does that mean? Stephen Hawking, paraplegic. He doesn't. He can't yeah. use his arms or his legs. So it's literally impossible yeah, for him that's to within kill physical, That's within physical limitations. Right. So that's that's all I'm saying. Is I mean, that's an physically... anomaly, but that's an anomalous example. So are you going to check, like, in this society where people literally physically can't kill, but they can think about killing people, but they can't physically do it? Yeah. Oh, Just like Stephen Hawking. Oh, like, like this morality physical field stops them, would stop them committing the act. Yeah. So they don't have free will. They still have free will, just like Stephen Hawking does. They don't, because if you can't, if you can't do the thing, this is literally C.S. Lewis's point about, like, why God uh doesn't stop things right well, so like so, so i can't instance, nuke instance, i can't instance, just, just give you an example i can't yeah. nuke a country i don't have any nuclear weapons does that mean i don't yeah. have free will you still have the free will to like if you were insane and you like now spent the rest of your life trying to acquire a nuclear weapon that would be you trying to enact that action sure i, I could try to enact it but i wouldn't be yeah. able to do it natural free will to do well we don't know because you never tried to acquire a nuclear weapon um well, well so, we haven't so the tried point... isn't that isn't that the point of science like it's unfalsifiable you've never tried to do what, it what what um no so like imagine all seven billion people on the planet wanted to oh. nuke someone there are not seven billion nukes so it is physically impossible for everyone to be able to nuke something they're still Can't in their free that's still in their free will free will isn't to do with whether or not something can be done free will is to do with your action your personal action your personal amount of freedom so someone could try to punch you, but if it was physically impossible, they still have free will. They've, because their they free will has been... Right, so, I mean, let me just turn to C.S. Lewis for this one, because a lot of people have this argument of, like, for instance, let's take, let's take the example of somebody wants to smash someone around the head with a piece of wood. Yeah? So there's one action there. One person, firstly, they have the thought, I really hate this person. I want to smash them around the head with a piece of wood. A lot of people object to Christianity because they would say, why, if God exists... Why doesn't he, at the moment that piece of wood hits the head, turn it into, let's say, water? So it just doesn't hurt, right? There's no suffering. This seems to be this, the almost like almost the same as the moral world you're putting forward. C.S. Lewis's point is that in doing that, God is actually altering the free will of that person because the action that they are undertaking isn't happening. You can't stop. It's 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 a human thing to have free will. So it's almost like someone goes to kill someone. You're equating the the action in their heart of killing someone with the actual action. But because there's no there's no conclusion, the thing hasn't actually happened. Their free will has been stopped because the thing they actually wanted to do, the consequences of their actions, are gone. So in, in your in your in your world, there's no consequences, which means there's no free will. Because it's consequences which make, what make you, your actions do you mean anything at all. How do you define free being will? being able to enact the things you want to do freely? So I can't enact the things I want. I can't fly. Do I not have free will? Oh man, that's come on. 
that's a physical limitation right I so also, physical limitations do not yeah phys oh you have limitations you have a, well no because it's just as natural limitation right so if there's a natural limitation it does not infringe free will free will within the limits of what is literally possible by the being which is enacting the free will right I think so if you change assessment. the limits of the being you have not infected you've not limited free will change the limits of the being just sounds like shackles so i can't fly usually... so so if i could fly and now i can't fly am i have i lost my free will if you could originally fly and then some for some reason someone stopped you from being able to fly then yeah so so well, breaking my well, so well, if well, i break well, someone's well, legs i think we need so so if i break someone's legs i've stopped their free will because they can no longer walk if they want to yeah i mean that's the reason there's punishment for it because we if you kill someone well i mean what's the understanding that killing someone is bad it's not it's not i think we need to i think we need to step back I, I, we, we've lost the thread we've lost well, the thread so so you you were arguing that my world doesn't have free will and my mm -hmm. counter to that is that the fact well, that there are physical limitations is not a violation of free will. Otherwise, this world would. would no, but it's not. This your world will. isn't to do with physical limitations. Your world is to do with like there is almost like you've implanted some buffer. No, no, no. People. It's it's literally a physical limitation. So it has. There's no. It's grown. It's like, like Darwin. It's like Darwinally. Darwinially. No, this has nothing to do with the individual. There is nothing in the individual that's changed. Nothing psychologically. Nothing physically in the individual is affected whatsoever. Right. So. Um, this is about a law of physics in the universe that does yeah. this. So it's like gravity. It's, it's, there's mm. there's no impact on the psychology of the individual. But it, ha it hasn't happened yet. No. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, or is this a hypothetical? Hopefully, yes. That is right. Okay. So here, here would be the question then. When this begin, this would obviously happen gradually, like sort of an evolutionary yes. thing. So then, at no. a certain point, no. So, so evolution it just is separate. Immediate. This has like nothing just... to do with evolution. This has nothing to do with evolution. Okay. But would it would it would it be that someone is born and then they are now in this field? I don't I don't understand the physics well enough. Like, is it like a veil that suddenly comes down and like you know, for instance, in twenty twenty four, like that's the year this moral physical law enacts. This law isn't here yet, is it? But it's going to happen. No, no. The, the law is here. It's just not strong enough to affect things. So if we could increase the strength of the law, it's intense. It's intensifying. Well maybe but, we, but our goal is to try to make the world as close to possible whether or not the law changes the law changing doesn't matter what the perfect world would be would be if this law was maximized whether or not it's going to happen it doesn't mm. matter and who's who's free someone who can kill someone who isn't under this law or someone who can't kill someone who is under the law um they're the same it makes no difference like wow. my definition of free will is the ability to do otherwise you, what does that mean? Um, means that you could um, take an action, do A, and it's not determined by prior causes. So if you went back, you could make a different decision, even under the same conditions. Yeah, but you, there, there's, there's just these decisions that have just been written off for you. No, the decisions are unaffected. There's no effect to the decisions. There's only an effect. You can't, the, you be, uh, we need to take a less morbid decision than killing someone, I think. Let's just say steal what, a jar of sweets. In this, in this is perfect society, you wouldn't be able to steal a jar of sweets, but you'd be able to think about stealing it. Yep. If that's the way you agree to it. So you could actually steal a bar of sweets mm -hmm. in this world. Yeah. So you could. Yeah. You just have to go to a world where that's allowed. So like, if you can design a world however you want, if you consensually mm -hmm. design it this way and people consensually enter this world, we, you can allow anything you want. Rape, murder, stealing. If people consensually agree to this contract and enter the world, then all actions in it are consensual. So you can still rape and murder and steal. That's totally fine. Um, that's why there's there's no none of the things are limiting the people. I guess at all my here. I guess I guess my point is that ultimately pure free will is the ability to unfortunately negate the free will of another. Like that's one of the ultimate things of free will, right? No. That has nothing to do with free will. Like that's just yeah, but free will is just your free will is your literally just your ability to act as you want to act. That's how Again, I that, see that free makes will. no sense as a definition because then literally no one has free will. No, 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 but act, act. I mean, no, I think, I think you're being very uh, needlessly linguistic about it. Like, because you're going to say, like, oh, if you want to fly, but it's like yeah. within the realms of reason. Well, no, no, th this we, is the point. We you're, know you're making what an arbitrary normal... distinction. No, you're, you're, you're making an oh, arbitrary no, distinction no. between the way things are now, and it's only free will if you have the freedom to do things as they are, as they are now. 
but no other possible hypothetical could apply. So if you could fly and then someone takes and you can't fly in this world, therefore it doesn't qual qualify as relevant to the free will discussion. Completely mm -hmm. arbitrary. No relevance. No. You can't use that definition. That that would you would you default. would you say there is there is like there is a normal human being? There's such a thing as a normal human being. No. Okay, then 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 our axioms are so far apart. I mean, at the point when you start saying there isn't a normal human being that has two arms, two legs, senses, that uh, I don't know, understand what world you're living in. Wait, there I isn't. Uh, there isn't a normal human being. Like you go, that's what that's what a human being is. I don't know what you uh, mean by that exactly. So, like, my point with this is, is you're on about free will, and you're saying, yeah, right. If I said to you, humans can't fly, you would you would say that's true, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I don't see why the flying things being brought in. We understand, generally speaking, what humans can do. Humans can't. We know what humans can do, right? We have this body. Like humans have this body. Yeah. 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 So then that's our limitation, and the free will is is the internal willed thing that we we can do within the limits that we're given. Stephen but Hawking that makes can just... no sense. It makes literally no sense. You're so free, free, will, free will for you free will is, is the, the ability to act in a human body and do what humans can do. And anything free, free, beyond wait, that wait, wait, is wait, wait. not. Free, free, free will for you is more the, the thing you want to do, not the actual result, not the actual action in yes, the empirical yes. world. Free will would be the desires and intentions, motivations. Well, a willed, a willed, a willed action without no actual action in the world. I mean, that's nothing. Well, that's not you, it's, you wouldn't the reason say, it's for instance, say, for instance, say, say, say for instance say for instance right now um you know i'm currently thinking that i want to fly is that an action in your brain oh come on well I, that wasn't meant as like a like like for instance like... right now like if 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 i said um i'm willing my arm to move but it but then i'm, I'm obviously not yeah. right because it's yeah. not moving that's free will to do that is free will and there's limitations and yeah, then, so free will, by yeah. my definition, is the ability to envision something. It is, is the freedom of your will. Envision to something. will what you want. So you you're not will... willing if it doesn't come about. Will is just a desire. So you can desire something without it coming about very easily. So, so when someone uses free sure, will, but, what but, they mean is that there's no... It's extremely well, just to clarify. if it's not going to happen, though. No, so like free will, the reason it's called free will and not free action is because you have an unrestricted ability to will things. Like if yep. you're determined to okay, will okay, something, then okay. you don't have free will. Okay. And so I was just not using the pedantic. Like, I think it's pedantic to do it where you just know that it's stupid to, because like I could, I could will the, I don't know, my I don't know. I don't know. I could will a ton of like you know you're not yes. willing it. Will a billion know. dollars to go into your bank? Yeah, account. yeah, exactly. Right, and we we both know that's stupid. Yeah, right. But so, but th this I is mean... the point you added to that definition. The way you seem to be defining free will means <sighs> the ability to will things and for them to happen or something along those lines within yeah. human limitations. I think those are the four criteria you have yeah, in yeah, your yeah, definition. Okay. Yeah. All right, it's an extended it's an extended definition, but I would say that the, the reason I include those things is because in a very practical sense. I mean, that's what we're actually dealing with in reality. But that's that seems to cause problems because then Stephen Hawking would not have free will because he, if your definition is as though oh, he has free will, will within, he has free, yeah, his ability to will things. And then, like, it's within his own limitations. So it's not just within human limitations, it's within human limitations and your particular limitations. Obviously, they're the limitations you have. I'm not Usain Bolt, I can't run 35 miles an hour. He well, has that his seems body. To be a problem though, because what if How's I make that problem? everyone? That's just what... what if I make everyone Stephen Hawking? So if if everyone well, that's is a, Stephen that's Hawking, that's a hypothetical. That's not right. right. right that's a hypothetical. You, you are you willing that right now? Guess what? It's not happening. So so the point of hypotheticals is to isolate variables to see if they're actually yeah, but logically just, consistent. Yeah, but you, no, but, yeah, but why not just deal with reality? Because the point of are hypotheticals... people different? Are people different? Sure, sure, right. yes. That like, we have different physicalities. Yes, but free will yeah. is supposed to be the same, right? Free will is the oh, thing. Oh, is... I, you know, to will is to do the same. But can right. Stephen Hawking run as fast as Usain Bolt, even if they both no. they both have the same will, right? They both have yes. the same will, Yeah, but they can't run the same. So right. there's a limitation. Right. Which is to do with their body. Right. And yeah. 
And you're saying that that means that certain at a certain point you're limited to what you can do, even if whether you will it or not. Right, and I'm saying that's okay, and that doesn't violate yeah. your free will, which is why right. I could limit everybody from stopping them from murdering. You them. Still are have limit. You are limiting people. Though. It's like authoritarianism. Yes. Like, like, like. Well, God is doing it in the first case. No, no, no. We still have complete free will with God. But he's limited within the limit. No, within the limitations that we've been given, we have which he gave us. So, so if I give us different limitations, like if, imagine I'm God for but a you moment. You can't do I, that. You can't do that though. <laughs> yet, uh, it's, yet, it, but... it's, it's, it's once again, it's axioms. Like once you begin from different axioms, it's just. I don't well, know. this is this is about a logical consistency. It's not about axioms. Axioms don't matter. Sure. I can just grant all of your axioms, and it won't make a difference to the argument here. Because the argument here well, is the, that the granted axiom is that we've we've been given what God God's given us, right? Sure. Yeah, and then you go, and then you have free will within that. Right, and so if we take a different hypothetical and say, "What if take God a different, gave us different take a di properties?" If we take a different axiom, then yeah, we have different no, no. This axioms. isn't a different axiom. This is not a different uh, axiom. So we're granting the uh, axiom. Uh, God gave us what He gave us. Okay, let's imagine He gave us something differently. It's still true that, that God. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. It's still true that God gave us what He gave us. That statement, yeah. that axiom, is yeah. still true in this analogy. So we can mm. isolate the variable and say, if God gave us the ability to not murder everyone. Would we still have free will? Just like God gave us the ability or gave Stephen Hawking not the ability to run, but he yeah. still has free will. If God gave us the ability to not murder people uh, or yeah. stopped us from murdering people, just like he stopped Stephen Hawking from running, we would still have free will by your definition. Yeah. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that seems like then I should be able to have free will in my world, just like you can if God just didn't gave everyone paraplegics. I feel like we, I feel like we've got nowhere. We've got less than nowhere. Well, I, I think I've very articulately explained my position and sure. the logical problem of your definition. That was the goal. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Bring up. Not really, man. I mean, the thing is, you emailed me and said this specifically wouldn't. I said I I don't do debates. Okay. So I wasn't expecting this to be a debate, to be honest. Otherwise, I would have actually prepared. All right, that's that's fair. Yeah. Anyway. Uh. Nice to meet you, man. All right. Nice to meet you too. Nice chatting. Uh, yeah. Talk to you yeah. later.